Yeah. And now you can oh. um, hit broadcast and we can start letting people in. I'll just be on mute and um, just turn my video off. I'll be here if you need anything, though. All right. I'll hit it now. Perfect. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Work. There we go. So, do you want me to just mute myself until you're ready? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll just do like a couple of minutes intro while people join. Okay, I can see a few people joining us now. About 40 people coming in. All right, so we're just going to wait a minute to um, let people join the webinar. Maybe while we're waiting, if you'd like to familiarise yourself with the Zoom window, if you're having any technical issues, just pop them into the, the chat window and we'll try and help you out there. So we'll just wait another minute or so before we start. Great to see lots of people joining us. Thanks everyone for being so punctual. <laughs> All right, I think we might get started. So I'll just start by saying hi everyone and welcome. Thank you very much for tuning in with us today. With National Threatened Species Day coming up next week, we thought it was a great opportunity to celebrate one of our resident threatened species. Kringka is home to over 30 threatened fauna species, and this includes birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. But I think the powerful owl might just be one of our most popular. And for good reason, they're fascinating birds. Today, we're lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Beth Mott for a presentation all about powerful owls. Beth is BirdLife Australia's Powerful Owl Project Officer and has been managing the project since 2017. Beth has a huge wealth of knowledge. She holds a PhD in conservation biology and is particularly interested in retaining wildlife in disturbed environments. She spent the last 20 years working with wildlife in deserts, rainforests, plantations and coastal communities all great places for a person with an unquenchable love for wildlife. Beth's career has seen her as a quoll trapper, a fish cartoonist, a lizard breeder, a frog and albatross wrangler, a flying fox mum, a dissector of feral cats and a wildlife educator, which basically just sounds like a great excuse to go and catch critters all the time. <laughs> While she always thought that she would end up either marrying or becoming David Attenborough, Beth finds educating people about wildlife and urban conservation almost as rewarding. So I'm sure we're in for a fantastic presentation today. Before I hand over to Beth, just a bit of Zoom housekeeping. We'll have some time for questions after the presentation. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask Beth, please just type them into the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of the screen. Um, feel free to post them in there as we go along, but we'll wait until the end of the presentation and then we'll try and answer as many as, many as we can. Um, if you have any technical issues, just pop them into the chat box and we'll try and help you out there. So I think that's probably it from me. I'll hand over to Beth and enjoy the presentation. Good morning all. This is a lovely way to spend our uh, morning tea break, I think, and I'm really glad to have so many of you um, dialing in to listen to this talk about Powerful Owl. Um, I've called this talk The Secret Life of Powerful Owl because even though these are a really large and majestic bird, I think they're one of the, um, one of the ones that we have in our backyards, particularly in the Greater Sydney Basin. We're really lucky to have quite a large population of Powerful Owls where we are in comparison to other parts of Australia. And, but even though they're this big, impressive, fantastic, majestic bird, often we don't know they're there because they do have quite a secret life. So I wanted to introduce you to the Powerful Owl and um, to tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, at BirdLife Australia with the Powerful Owl Project. And hopefully there'll be um, lots of discussion at the end of this. So I'm gonna talk for about 20, 25 minutes, which is a really short amount of time to tell you all the great stuff that we're doing with Powerful Owl. 
So unfortunately, I didn't put too many videos in today because they just take up quite a bit of time, but hopefully the images will speak for themselves. I thought I'd quickly introduce you to who we are. Um, so uh, the Powerful Hour project is one of BirdLife's um, urban bird program projects. And we've been working in the Sydney Basin since 2011, looking at the ecology of urban powerful hours particularly. So there's a fair bit of early research that went on in Australia with um, powerful hours in forested areas, but um, definitely urban research has been growing in the uh, ensuing probably the last 10 years. And there's quite a body of this research going on. In fact, I think for one of our threatened species and the biggest of our large forest hours, probably the powerful hour is one of our best known of the Australian hours. Um, Usually we see pictures of them like this one in your screen with their big staring eyes, but I really love the whimsy of this really gentle nature that a lot of our top predators have where they're very confident about themselves. So often what we like to see is really calm pictures of powerful hours like this little guy on the right hand side who's having a snooze. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we monitor the breeding ecology of powerful owl and also look at threats to um, what's going on with the population in Greater Sydney and in as many areas as we can get data on. Um, I can't do all of that work alone, so it's a large citizen science project um, which I help to manage along with Holly Parsons from BirdLife and um, along with me there are over 500 citizen scientists involved in the project who help me collect that data. Um, there are different regions where powerful owl occur in the Greater Sydney Basin, so in the northern beaches Jackie Marlow um, from Sydney Wildlife helps a lot with the management of that part of the population down in Sutherland, Lloyd Hedges who's pictured here um, which helps to manage and up on the Central Coast, Alan Morris does a great job. Could not do this work without the help of so many fantastic people and um, I'm really excited to welcome more of you on board if you're um, engaged and want to become a part of it. We're coming to the end of the, the exciting part of the breeding season now where all the chicks are popping out of hollows um, but um, we'll certainly start training for the next breeding season as time moves on after Christmas. I think one of the beauties of the project is not just that we, which I love to do of course, is to run around in the forest and monitor um, what the birds are doing, but a part of the project is really a strong education component and we're really happy to be able to, to produce some great resources for the public to learn more about powerful hours and for our land managers to do better in um, working out what we can do to manage the land. So this document protecting powerful hours in urban areas is a community group. The Powerful Hour Coalition, who's written this fantastic book. It's available online. I think I forgot to put the link on the on the presentation, but certainly give me an email afterwards if you'd like to know where to find it. Um, these guys are doing great work in advocacy and um, in uh, public education as well. So always happy to welcome other people who are interested in doing their own actions to save our large forest hours, because of course these are species that are declining pretty rapidly. And of course. Whilst we work to conserve powerful owl as our largest owl and a big top predator, if we can protect the habitat that that bird needs, we automatically protect a lot of habitat that many of our smaller birds need, like this little spinebill on your screen now. And he's one of the species that uh, of our small foliage birds that's actually declining. And in fact, retaining some of the characters that a big bird like powerful owl need will automatically retain the characters that little guys need. And of course, the smiliest echidna you've ever seen in this picture it also retains habitat for a whole swathe of creatures, not just birds. And I guess that's why I love this project, is that we're working um, to do a really holistic approach to habitat conservation um, based on what powerful owls need, which is fantastic. Um, powerful owl are a forest bird. They are heavily associated with creek lines. That's where that you can always find them because there are species that breeds in winter. So unlike many of our other um, owls which, and birds particularly, which breeders the weather gets warm, these are winter specialist breeders. And it means that their feathers are designed to keep heat in. So they really struggle in the hot time of the year, which means that if you were looking for them in summertime, it's always down in the creek ways that where you look. The population goes from about Mackay in Queensland down the eastern coast to the border of South Australia. Um, but we know that a lot of this distribution where these red points lie do not support powerful owl anymore. Part of that is um, a known decline associated with habitat loss, but part of it is also um, an unexplained decline, which we're seeing in a lot of forest owls. They're just disappearing, even from areas that aren't really impacted by disturbance. And there's not a good explanation for it. But what we're seeing conversely is this increase in owls moving over to the east coast. So in these urban spaces, some species of owls can do what, quite well, and powerful owl are, of course, one of those. And of course, the bushfires that we saw over Christmas time and into the beginning of the year had a massive 
impact on the population and we were looking at potentially a little more than a third of the whole range of the species lost in that fire event. So it means that conserving the owls in the urban population becomes really important because they're the source of recruitment into the forested population as time goes on. They're, they're really important. I wanted to show you the suite of owls that you'll see um, if you're in the Sydney Basin. These are some of the species that you're likely to encounter. And there's powerful owl, this big guy up here on the left hand side, cashing his dinner. Um, mast owls, barn owls, boobook owls, barking owls and sooty owls down the bottom. So of those uh, group of owls, there are these four species in the red are the ones that are actually um, threatened species. And whilst we would estimate, and the estimates for powerful owl numbers vary, they go in New South Wales from somewhere around 2,000 individuals to potentially as many as 6,000 individuals. And, and we know that New South Wales holds half of the population of powerful owls. So um, we're talking about half of the population where we are and potentially about um, maybe a fifth of that population in the Sydney Basin in the urban areas where we live. But whilst we talk about powerful owl, mast owl and sooty owl are actually doing far worse and we would estimate somewhere in the order of maybe only 3,000 pairs in New South Wales. So it's really important that we conserve habitat for powerful owl and as I said, for the rest of these other species, because often this, these owls all use the same types of um, preferred habitat character. And so um, we can multitask and look after one species, but many. I wanted you to just hear a couple of noises of um, owls that you're likely to hear in your place. The first one, of course, is our boobook owl. People hear that and go, yes, that's a sound I do recognise. So this is a really common forest owl. They often hang out in the same place, space as powerful owl. But the powerful owl is the guy that we would love to be able to hear. And they have this really distinctive double hoop call. Uh, for the females, it sounds like this. For the males, they have a deeper tone often. And people talk about powerful owl calls and identifying the sexes as an inflected upwards hoot or a downwards hoot, but it's not a hard rule. So here I'll play you the female again. And her husband. And of course, chick season, which is what we're in at the moment, where all the babies are coming up out of the hollows. They look fluffy and white like this young one. And they sound quite different. So you get this trilling sound. I'll play it for you. Play it again. So that's the noise that I want you to tell me that you're all hearing in your backyards because that trilling is the gold standard of our research in the urban space. We will always love to know that we're having babies come into the world. Sorry, Beth. I, I don't think those calls are being heard by anyone. Ah, well, there's no more calls in the presentation. So um, oh, all of the sorry, calls are everyone. actually available on the Powerful Our Project webpage. So if you search for that and scroll to the bottom, there's a whole heap of calls um, that you can listen to there, both chick calls and adult calls as well. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick look about where what the territories look like in the Sydney Basin. So all of these yellow points, squares that you can see on the screen are the um, are our territories that are currently held and we know about uh, know of about 230 odd territories at the moment. When we look at what they're doing in uh, close up, these yellow squares show where the owls are hanging out. But one of the things that I wanted you to note particularly is that these blue points that are on the screen are sightings from the public. So that is where it's really important that you guys tell us where it is that you're hearing owls because often people hear owls in their area but they don't realise how important they are. And they say, oh, we've been hearing owls here for 30 odd years but it, if they're not reported to anybody and the land managers don't know about them, then we can't do our best to protect them because the project spends a lot of time communicating with land managers, particularly around things like fire management um, to make sure that we retain all of the important features and the birds themselves when we need to manage land. So knowing where the owls are is really, really important for us. So as you can see from this sighting, we might know where the owls are breeding, but often there are blue points up here where we know owls have been seen or heard that um, we need to record. And then when we hear or, or are reported of those things, we go and investigate and hopefully find that there are more owls with us. One of the other things I guess to note about this picture is how associated with the creek lines the owls are, but have a look at where the owls are hanging out in relation to the suburb. These little pushes of green forest that are just gully lines that go up into the suburbs are incredibly important. And I guess the reason Sydney is so great for powerful owls is that we have a lot of this really bumpy topography and that allows a lot of gully development and owls of course are exploiting that, they're very good at doing that. 
one of the things that we know about owls, of course, is that they um, move through the suburbs rather than just staying in that green patch. And so here's um, an owl that was uh, radio trapped in 2016. She's wearing a backpack. And you see this pattern that's really typical where they go to sleep in the green patch and then fly into the suburbs to get dinner and go back to the green patch and fly out into the suburbs to get dinner again. So this pattern of movement, of course, exposes owls to a whole heap of things. It's great to shop for possums in the suburb because it's much easier to catch dinner there, but it also means that owls are moving um, this place where they like to breed and to live quite close to the urban boundary. And that's a huge issue because that's where we're doing all of our fire management, particularly at the moment. And so owls become quite at risk um, because they're hanging out right on this space between the urban boundary. And usually we find that that um, nest tree is often only 50 metres from the edge of the urban space. So it's generally pretty close to where we are. Of course, moving into the suburb exposes owls to a whole heap of things, castrate being the one that we record the most for the birds in the Sydney Basin population. Um, we know that of the recorded mortalities every year, castrate make up almost 75% of everything that we record dying, and we know there are a lot more that we, we are not recording. Um, this owl that's actually in the picture here was my great hope. The first week I started this project, this one was killed about a kilometre from my house. So. Um, at the moment, at that time, it was one of the only our families that we knew of down south where I lived. Um, we're lucky to have found another four or five where we are, but this um, idea of car strike and where it's happening is something that we work heavily on in the project to try to stop happening. And I guess one of the really exciting things for me is that we've um, been granted a couple of grants lately to actually work specifically on working out how else and move through the urban space. Um, the project's got our highways in the city and I've got two grants um, from the Foundation for National Parks and Wildlife and really excitingly just recently from the Karingai Council to look at um, how it is that owls move in the urban space and this is really important because we know that owls can't get to where they need to get to because of all the sorts of development that we're having in the urban spaces and it's often fairly hard for owls to move around even though the gully lines might look like green on the map when you go and investigate them they'll often be logged or um, there's a suburb being built beside them and so we lose all of that good corridor effect that those green spaces are having. So one of the ways to work out where it is that we, we should be building corridors or developing them or bulking up what we already have there is to work out where ours want to go and the way that we can do that is actually to use shed feathers. So um, the picture that you can see on screen is um, the same feather. One of them's taken in uh, white light at the top of the screen and that pink at the bottom is the same feather in UV light. So feathers do an amazing job quite helping us to understand owls. They let us um, now using genetics work out where owls want to move so we can build those corridors, but they also let us work out um, who it is that's have impacted by road trauma. And um, they also work out the health of the population. So one of the two really big projects that I'm working on at the moment in the project is to look at um, this corridor development, but also to look at rodenticide poisoning. I'm doing that work with um, Dr. Tracy Russell, which is super exciting. And we've just uh, got the first batch of data away to the lab at the moment. So more results coming on that, hopefully by Christmas time or in early January. And I'll be really happy to invite everyone to come along and and we'll have another talk about where we should be putting corridors to help our population of fauna. Of course, when owls can't get to where they're going, this is often what happens. So here are young birds trying to disperse and instead of finding a corridor to actually sit in, they end up sitting in really weird places like factories or often on top of cars. So this is one of the things the project is directly trying to prevent by working out where we should, where we should create our, our highways for our population to remain healthy. Collecting feathers is a hard task. Owls don't shed feathers all the time, although now the season for feather collecting is just coming up. But luckily I have some help. You can see my lovely little um, scrub friend, friend here collecting feathers merrily. And uh, this is an, a nest that I found um, last year. And you can see that it's actually full of uh, powerful owl feathers and there's boo book owl feathers, all sorts of owl feathers. Great for nest lining. And so I'm not working alone in the feather collection. I have helpers in the world. <laughs> And I, I guess I just wanted to quickly run through a few things that you can do um, to help um, in your neck of the woods to help these guys. Um, of course, as I said, reporting that the owls are there are incredibly important. You can do that by creating an account with bird data, which is our national database for um, recording bird sightings. And you can put powerful owls in there, but all sorts of other birds as well. So anything that you're seeing, which is a really great database and communicates with your national parks 
database to make sure that everyone knows who needs to know where the birds are. Um, but if you don't want to do that, reporting directly to me at the Powerful Hour project, powerfulhour.birdlife.org.au is a fantastic way to get your sightings in. Sometimes bird data is too fiddly for people, but I'm really happy to have everyone's email um, and for them to tell me what it is they're seeing and hearing. All of it's incredibly valuable. Um, for Powerful Hours, retaining the population and making sure that it's healthy is really about how many trees with hollows that we have. We know that hollow bearing trees take about 150 years to develop for powerful hour. We know we selectively cut them down in the environment because we consider that they're quite dangerous. Um, and we know that living and dead trees function really differently in supporting our breeding. And I guess, as I mentioned before, one of the really important things about this is that edges are incredibly important here. And the tree that you're looking at in the picture there really sits about 30 metres off somebody's back fence. Um, we know that hollows are incredibly high density living. Once powerful hours fledge chicks out of the hollow and the chicks leave the hollow, generally another species is back in the hollow and using it within half a day. Um, here you can see a little owlet in this hollow and the kookaburras are nesting in this bottom hole here. This was taken a couple of years ago in North Sydney. But I've seen um, situations where one single tree with hollows will actually support eight or nine different bird families breeding. So these hollow bearing trees are a huge part of the story for making sure our, our threatened owls stay with us. And it's not just um, tree hollows that are important for owls. Of course, things like um, termite mounds are becoming more used. Here's a little uh, powerful owl in a, in a termite hollow that we took a couple of years ago. And whilst the powerful owls were not using the hollow, boobal cows got in there and used it. So there's the opportunity for things other than tree hollows to um, work for breeding, but not um, nest boxes, unfortunately. Someone will probably ask me about that in question time. They don't work for powerful hour, but there are other ways that we can boost the habitat to improve that for owls. Of course, owls love tree hollows and need them to have babies, but it's um, the roost zones where they hang out for most of the year when they're not in the breeding and not in the hollows that are equally important. And often these things are really not valued. Um, so here's a situation in Western Sydney where um, this is this dead stick that you can see in the middle of the thing, what used to be the roost area for the powerful owl and everything is cleared away from there. So when you look at it on a satellite image, it looks like a lovely patch of habitat, but when you get on the ground and actually survey, often these things are fairly degraded. But without those really cool roost environments, owls cannot stay with us because they just get too hot. So retaining those is really important. And of course, looking at the structure of the vegetation is really important too. You can see my little owl chick down on the ground here. He's just fledged and he's come to ground and he's um, trying to get back up to mum and dad in the ferns that are at the back of him here. Usually when a chick comes to ground, it means a fox comes along or a dog and the owl chick is lost almost straight away. We were lucky to have really windy conditions in this year and the chick did manage to climb through this vegetation to get back up to mum and dad. But because our chicks are such terrible flyers, if they don't have the opportunity to climb because we don't retain this lovely complex understory which also supports our small birds, then owls just can't get back up to mum and dad. And we have a few situations in Sydney where every year the owls just come to ground and are killed because they can't get back up. So one of the things that we're really working on with our land managers is educating about the importance of understory and how we can use that to bolster our bird populations as a whole. And there are a whole heap of things that are developing threats for these owls. Um, I put this picture of this little chicken here on the right hand side. He's actually just been through a burn. He got out of the hollow the day before and there's still smouldering embers underneath his feet, um, but managed to survive quite well, even though the parents were lucky. We had a smoke inversion event and they moved the chick away from the smoke, so he managed to survive. But this idea that, um, that we, I guess what we really need to think about how fire is managed and that is a part of that is really understanding that if we don't report where birds are, we can't um, educate our land managers about what to do to make sure the owls stay with us. So fire is a big thing, of course, as we know, there's about 15 burns that have been escalated in the last um, week or so because there's this whole push to um, increase the size and management, they call it aggressive management of these zones that protect the houses from the forest, which is incredibly valid but we need to do that in a way that hopefully can uh, also protect our threatened species. Glass strikes a big thing for powerful owls and of course urban lighting is coming in being quite important for a nocturnal species. Um, the amount of light in the environment will affect how they're going. So that's something, all of these things are things that we're collecting data on. 
I'll stop talking now and Chelsea can come back on and field some questions. I tried to be fairly quick because <laughs> I know that probably people have a lot to ask me. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead now. All right, thank you so much, Beth. That was really interesting. I always feel like I, I learn something whenever I hear from you. So yeah, it was fantastic. Um, we've only had one question come in um, so far, so please jump on and, and start typing in your questions. We've had one qu question though, it says, um, I live on Scotland Island and it seems that we have a strong population of powerful owls. Is this the case compared to other Greater Sydney areas? Yeah, the Northern Beaches is a really odd spot for powerful owl and I think a part of this is about the way owls are breeding at the moment. We're finding that um, I think what's going on with the owls is that where we thought owls were moving from the forest and coming into the city, what we're actually seeing is this really successful breeding in our urban spaces where owls move from there back out to the green space. Um, Scotland Island is a fantastic jump off point. We know that owls bred there last year and hopefully they will again and hopefully someone will tell me about it, which would be great to record. Um, the Northern Beaches is a massive stronghold for owls and we have something like 25 territories in that little Bit just around the pit water and up into Whale Beach, which is pretty amazing. Um, the, there are definite hotspots for our activity in the Sydney Basin, Pennant Hills being one of them and Lane Cove Valley being another. And um, we're finding a real uh, resurgence of ours actually in Balkan Hills at the moment, which is important because we um, convey all of that information to our urban planning department and this massive expansion of Greater Western Sydney encompasses a lot of these areas and we're sort of planning the development of the Sydney around threatened species at the moment. So knowing where the owls are is a great way to actually make sure we do our best as we move forward in proactively developing an environment where, where all of our fauna can stay with us. Um, so um, come through. Um, because the city is quiet now, I'm guessing that's um, just during the COVID restrictions maybe. Um, are more owls moving in or are there just not enough trees elsewhere? Are you seeing well, any increase in population maybe? I think actually for the bushways, it's an incredibly busy time because people aren't going to the gym, so they're using the bushlands as a way to exercise. So I've found, you know, and our um, volunteer body have found masses of impact in the green spaces where the owls are. Um, it would have been less um, worrying earlier in the season because often ours are so camouflaged people don't even know they're there but now the chicks are up and boombastic and calling we might start to run into problems particularly with things like unleashed dog walking which tends to be pretty impactful on our young birds that are up and coming as I said they don't fly well and they often end up on the ground. Um, it, powerful owls live a long time so we're talking about species that don't migrate they stay in the territory that they choose if they can retain it and make sure no other owls get in there for as much as 30 odd years. Um, so they're not a species that will move in and out of the city quickly. So this influx of birds from the Western city has been quite a gradual thing. If we look at the Aboriginal records for, for powerful owl in the Sydney Basin, they weren't recorded a hundred years ago. There's not even a word in um, Darug for um, powerful owl. So um, this, this resurgence of owls into the urban space is actually quite new, but really important as we lose those owls out of our forested spaces. So it's something that I'm, um, we're working on, trying to understand more about and a part of this feather project will actually give us a lot of that information to work out who's going where, and that concentrates our actions to retain certain bits of the habitat. And I'm hoping, you know, that this is gonna tell us a, a fantastic story about which parts of the urban space are important for owls. Yeah, that's great. I'm really looking forward to hearing the results from your study as well. Um, we've had one come through about um, the use of rodent poisons. Um, how are they affecting populations? I know you've looked at um, the analysis of pellets, I think. Um, yeah, what, what do you think about that? Well, the, the idea is that the real answer to that question is we don't have the data yet. Um, based mm -hmm. on the research in WA, we know that bubble cows are terribly affected by rodenticides um, and lots of the population that live around urban areas and the more urban the birds are the higher the likelihood that they will be affected by rodenticides and carry levels of poison that are beyond lethal often. So what we have uh, with ours is this accumulation of poisons um, 
the, the more food they eat, each time they eat something, they get a bigger dose of poison. So often they can actually persist with very large amounts of poison in their body. We don't know how powerful they are going with this yet. We've just started collecting the data and we're working with Taronga Zoo and, and also the museum um, to, to progress that research. Um, I suspect that it's going to be very problematic the more urban the hours are. We know that those hours that are existing right inside the, the very urban parts of Sydney City eat primarily rats and they're of course one of the biggest sources of rodent poisoning. Um, and then as you move out to the more leafy suburbs of Sydney, they like to eat rabbits. And then when you get right out into the forest again, they're eating things like that, uh, like uh, possums, which is what, what they generally would have eaten. So until we get the data back, I don't have a real answer for that. But my suspicion is that particularly those urban owls, which we know tend to survive very poorly because they're, they're hit by cars, are probably um, going to be impacted by rodenticide. Um, we don't know if a part of this car strike is actually an underlying problem with the population where they're already weakened by things like rodenticide. And I guess that's what the research is trying to identify. And of course, we can use that information to change our laws about the availability of rodent poisoning, which is what's going on at the moment. Yeah, fantastic. Um, a question about nesting boxes. Why why don't nest boxes work for the powerful owls? Ah, I wish we all knew. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, we just don't know why they don't work. And a part of what we're doing is trying to understand that. So at the moment, everyone's been trying. Um, we've spent about 30 years trying to get a nest box to work for um, powerful owl. It's worked one time ever, <laughs> for one breeding season ever, and that was it. Um, a part of it is I think that we don't understand the way um, tree hollows behave. What we know is that mum sits in the hollow, sitting on eggs for a month, and then the babies are in the hollow for a month or so before they come up to the top. So the outlets that you can see on the screen on the left-hand side are a couple that are just about to fledge. This picture was taken about two days ago in, in Western Sydney, hooray, hooray. But um, um, the environment inside a tree hollow has to be this incredibly dynamic recycling environment and I think that's something that we can't replicate in nest boxes. It might be that we can make a nest box that's um, the right shape for powerful owl and, and sort of looks like a tree hollow but it doesn't contain the fungi and the microbes and the bacteria that recycle all those bits of possum and bat that are being fed to the family every day because if you look in an owl hollow just after the family has finished using it it's actually incredibly clean. There's no bits and pieces left behind. You might see a few shards of bone but it just looks like friable dirt in the bottom of the hollow and I think that's one of the key things that we are missing in our nest boxes and the other thing is that many of those timber nest boxes that we generally build tend to be a lot hotter than ours can support based on the project uh, the pilot project that we've just been doing with nest boxes so it's an ongoing thing I think in terms of nest boxes you can develop nest boxes for some of our smaller owls we know that our booble cows will use nest boxes and there are um, plans for those nest boxes uh, on the um, Urban Birds page on BirdLife if you're interested and for a whole suite of species. But um, for the large forest owls, we really need to continue working to try to get something that's going to do the right job. And so far we haven't found it. Okay, a question has come in about predators. So other than ground predators like um, foxes and dogs and cats, are there any other predators for the birds? Um, they do actually um, aggressively defend territory. So sometimes, um, particularly last year, and I think this is a problem with running out of space in the Sydney Basin and why we need to change the way we plant trees to build better um, conduits for owls to move around, is that um, we're running out of space and we see aggression ramping up. So we do see owls attack, um, powerful owls attack other owls and also other powerful owls. Um, could you repeat the question again? I've lost track of it. Um, just about any other predators. Oh, other predators. Yes, so they're a top predator. They're what we call a super predator, and that means as an owl, they actually do eat other owls, which is quite rare for, for other top predators to eat within their own type of animal. Um, but owls do that. Um, they are a good biological control agent. Um, they are eating things like rats, rabbits, um, foxes are being eaten by powerful owl and also things perhaps we don't want them to eat like small koalas <laughs> and threatened species like fruit bats as well. Um, predators primarily are those things that are going to eat them when they're down on the ground when they're young. Um, there is some, uh, as I said, some aggression between adult birds but often those interactions are not fatal. 
Um, in terms of flying around in the treetops and being eaten by anything, no, there are no predators when they're up and moving around and on the wing. So generally that predation is in this really vulnerable stage like the chicks that you can see on the screen there. Um, I think one of the things that um, more impactful for them is the competition with other birds for resources and for tree hollows particularly because there are so few big hollows big enough to support breeding left in the environment which is why there's that really high turnover of hollow use when birds get in there. So we do see cockatoos actually trying to get the hollows that the owls are breeding in. Um, they will pull the chicks out and kill them and carry them away. And um, at night time, the owls will fly around eating the cockatoos. So there's a massive battle for who it is gets to use that tree hollow. And I think that's probably likely to be more impactful than the loss of our young chicks down on the ground because that prevents any breeding from going on if the cockatoos particularly win, but also corellas are a part of that. And um, some of the other aggression that we're seeing is associated with the black and white birds, which we know are getting up in huge numbers in the urban space. So currawongs, magpies, um, also ravens. And if there's not enough green patch left for the chicks to put themselves, or, and the adult birds to put themselves away and roost where they're hidden, they're being attacked by the, um, by the black and white birds. And we've seen that for the last couple of years where this aggression has become increasingly um, more escalated and it's resulting in the death of chicks. Wow. Gosh, they've, they've got it tough. <laughs> they have got it tough. And yeah. in fact, I want to put some data together and I'll put it up on the Powerful Hour page to show you the sorts of impacts that are facing the whole population because people think, there's ours here, you know, there, um, there's a development going on, my ours are in trouble. But in fact, when you look at that across 18, 20, 30 different places in the Sydney Basin, the whole population really is under stress. That's why we work to do so well to try to, you know, make sure everyone knows to do the best that they can to keep them with us. Okay, so we've had a question um, about their lifespan. You mentioned that they're very long lived. Um, what is their actual lifespan? And a follow on question was um, how many offspring do they have each year? Is it just right. one chick or multiple? Right. Um, so that we don't actually know is the true answer to the question of how long they live. We know that in captivity they live for over 50 years and we would um, estimate down for a wild existence to be somewhere between 25 and 30 years. But I think the beautiful thing about our territories is that when one set of individual owls moves on from the territory or is lost from the territory, the next generation of owls will come in and use exactly the same space, even to the same branch where the old owls used to sit. So these places in the, in the environment are kind of placeholders for future generations of owls as well. They're really important. They give us a map about the things that we should be trying to conserve because they're always going to like to use the same thing, even if it's a different individual owl. Um, so, yeah, roughly, we don't know, but roughly about 25 to 30 years. And the second part of the question was? Uh, how many uh, chicks per year? Uh, yeah, so usually it would be, it, usually we would say two would be the maximum. There are a few cases where we've had three chicks produced. I think in the, we've actually got one this year, but it's being burnt next week. So we'll see how we go. Um, um, we've recorded three chick clutches about five times since 2011, so it happens really rarely. Um, uh, usually it's two chicks, but for the past two years, it's actually been one chick or no chicks. So um, the drought situation and um, the whole heap of other pressures have really been impacting on the population in the last couple of years. And I think chick, um, we, I can't count the chicks this year, we're too early, we're about 50 chicks up this year, but um, between 2018 and 19, single chick clutches were only 40% of the population and moved to about nearly 70% of all of the breeders that we had only producing one chick last year. So this is a real worrying trend and it's associated with, I think, um, the drought conditions that we've been having, which will reduce the amount of possums that are available as the, the primary prey base. But um, I think there's a disease process going on in the population too. And I guess that's one of the reasons your reporting is so important. Um, what I'm hearing in my owls and throughout the whole population, I'm hearing this really croaky sort of call where they go, ooh, 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 this attenuated call and people write in saying it sounds like he's got a sore throat. It's our COVID. No, <laughs> but I think that's actually um, a disease process that's going on with the population. So whilst I do the autopsies and the feather work and the roadkill work, I'm also working with some fantastic pathologists to look at developing diseases in owls. And hopefully we won't see that happening, but I suspect that's what's going on. Yeah, wow. 
Yeah, so following on from that, someone has asked um, about reporting of the sightings. So when when people report them, is it important to, for them to have seen them and heard them or is no. just hearing them sufficient? Yeah, just hearing them is absolutely sufficient. They have a really distinctive call. If anyone is making hoo-hoo down here, it's a powerful owl. There's only two owls in Australia that are hoo-hoo and the other one is the rufous owl, which is in North Queensland. And maybe if you're somewhere around Currumbin or the border of Queensland and New South Wales, you might get both species, but generally rufous owls are further north and we have powerful owl down here. So that double hoot call, mm -hmm. that's a powerful owl. And sightings where you've heard it only are just as important as, um, as when you've seen the bird. And often people only know they're there by hearing and that's just as good. So I'd love to hear about all of that. Fantastic. And um, how big is the owl's wingspan? I know it's uh, the, yes. <laughs> our largest owl. So, yeah. Yes. What's the ah, I've measured it. It's actually my elbow to my fingertips. So 1.5 metres. And they stand at about 60 centimetres high when they're adult. And in fact, when the chicks come up out of the hollow, as per these little chicks that you can see on screen, they're almost as big as the adults by the time they emerge. So they're going from a chicken egg to an owlet, really in maybe six weeks of growing, which is pretty amazing. It would be amazing to see it, put a camera in there and actually watch them and into owlet. Um, yeah, so um, that's the answer. Next one. All right, so next one. Um, someone has said, um, thank you for the talk. Um, what is the prey preference? Um, how can we increase the availability of prey and have you reviewed availability of the habitat for prey that's better for hunting by owls? Um, we're working on all of that stuff. I need a GAF person to come on board and do all the great stuff for me. Um, but a part of that, hopefully, um, I'm hoping as a part of what we do with the, um, the corridor mapping that the council will come, become involved and we can do that as a really a collaborative um, part of work. Um, can you just say it again? Yeah, so how can we increase the oh, availability? Increase, yes, so we can increase the availability of the prey by putting up possum, possum boxes for the number one because the prey base is generally associated with possums unless you're right in the middle of, of Sydney. So ringtail possums are the preferred prey, but they also eat brushtail possums. And we know that possums are a species that we don't really understand in the urban basin, we just consider that they're a common species, so no one really looks at how many of them there are. But we do know that um, the wildlife um, databases suggest that possums actually are in decline, which might be one of the reasons that we see chick numbers declining for Papalal as well. So increasing the prey base involves planting corridors. Um, to get a good, healthy possum population, you have to have connection of trees that allows possums to move, because that's how they forage. In your own backyard, possum boxes can definitely do a great thing. If you can um, understand that owls may move in and actually come and, <laughs> may I come and sample your possums, and that's very traumatic for some people. Um, so possum boxes and planting are really the two things that are going to help us boost the prey population. And also planting for species that fruit bats, um, because in the urban space, owls eat a lot of fruit bats compared to the owl forested population of owls. So, things that fruit bats like to eat and encouraging fruit bats to actually move into camps. We have this idea that fruit bats are noisy and stinky and people don't really like them, but they really need a place in the environment and they're one of our species that are struggling as well. And they're a big part of the prey base, as I said, for urban owls. So really those are the things that are going to help us um, boost the prey. And that's how you will help your powerful owls. Often I'm a wise carer, which I've been doing for the last 10 or so years down here and for many years before that in North Queensland. Um, in the wise population, we see many of our possum carers being visited by owls. <laughs> so actually boosting your popul possum population will work and help the owls in your local area move in. Okay, so someone has asked um, about hazard reduction burning. I know it's something that you touched on during the talk. Um, so the question is, how do we as land managers balance hazard reduction burning and cultural burning? as well as sort of keeping and um, retaining a complex understory for the powerful owls? Uh, incredibly hard to do. And I think a part of that is really being aware of the timing of events. If there's the opportunity to be flexible about when burning can occur, that will, and to be, make sure that we retain a really good conduit of communication between people that are monitoring whatever the animal is and 
our land managers, I think that's essential because oftentimes we might say powerful our breeding starts in April and finishes in October. But as per this season, if we knew that we had an early season, you might be able to do your burns in September because we know that the outlets are already up and moving about and they're not going to be affected by the fire. And that conduit of communication is really what's going to allow us to develop the best land management practices. Um, it's extremely hard. You have to pick sometimes. And in some cases, burning is absolutely essential. We saw what happened and we've seen the recommendations of the reports about fire and how we should be managing land. And we know that that's going to um, try to encourage more frequent and more aggressive burning. But given that we know that this species is such an edge species, if we know where they are, there's the opportunity to perhaps um, really be mindful of the space that the owls are needing, which is often a very distinctive sort of space in the environment and to retain that and to burn around it and to protect that space whilst you're burning. Um, certainly that's the way that I've been working for the last couple of years with national parks where we have this great channel where we talk about every burn that's going to happen and whether that's going to affect the owls and whether there's an opportunity to do the burn or and in some cases you will have to sacrifice your breeding in a year potentially for the opportunity to protect houses and that's a matter of working really closely together I think and, and trying to do our best to, to keep talking about it. Yeah, um, so someone has asked, um, at what age do the owlets typically leave the nest? Do they still hang out with mum and dad as youngsters? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> they do hang out with mum and dad. So often you'll see when they fledge as these little ones, um, the little one on the right hand side is doing that mum and dad will bracket the owlet. I'm the owlet here and here's my two parents on either side of me. Um, so they'll sit together as a family generally for probably for um, as many as three months after the babies come out of the hollow. And then generally you'll see the babies, whether it's one chick or two, they'll sit together and then the parents will sit a little bit further away. And as we get closer to dispersal, they move further apart in the environment. And then the babies will go. We would have said they would have gone by March, but we're finding that they're staying around a bit later. They might be as coloured as mum and dad, but they will look, um, but they'll still be trilling like babies and still being fed by mum and dad who must know that the owlet won't survive if they don't continue to feed it. So we've seen that happening up until May in a couple of instances, which is again indication that the population is actually under stress in terms of being able to find enough food. Um, and then by May, the, usually the young ones will disperse and we don't know where they go. We don't, you can't, they're really hard to catch these birds and often you'll force dispersal if you try to do something really invasive like catching. So we're hoping this feather work will actually give us a really good roadmap for where it is that our babies are trying to get to so they don't land on top of cars. Um, and what we're seeing a lot in the population is instead of the, the babies dispersing and going to a whole new patch that they just stick right on the margin of the parents' territory while the new breeding season starts again. So we've seen that in about um, probably a handful of incident, incidences last year and again it seems to be happening this year which might suggest that we're starting to run out of space that the population is at capacity. Okay, a question about being territorial. So are the owls territorial? And if so, does this impact um, or does the amount of habitat available impact the numbers? So I guess, um, you know, is there a certain size um, needed, a, a certain patch size needed? Yes. Yeah. And that's about how much dinner there is there for, to support breeding and to support the owls living. They don't, they maintain a core part of the territory where the nesting goes on that they defend from other birds and all of that noisy hooting is about that defensive process to tell the other owls, I live here, you come from. But they do actually share territory. So the radio tracking that we that was done in 2016 shows owls from different territories flying into the same tree at different parts of the same night, actually hunting in the same patch. So there's overlapping movement of owls in the territories, but that little core part where the breeding goes on, where those nest trees are, is the one that's defended. But it's not generally defended when breeding is not happening. So that only goes on in that time when they're, probably from March until I'd say probably until the chicks fledge, which could be between April, August and October, um, that that core part of the territory is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, someone else has asked about their home ranges as well, just about the size, um, yes. whether there's like a, a smallest range and a largest in, in hectares, so. Yeah, um, well, we, in, in the urban space, it's easier to work in kilometres sometimes because you can put a radius around it. But generally about, 
we would say the standard size that we've been measuring in the urban space is about 2 k's. We know that when we change that to hectares and go to forest hours, we're looking at somewhere in the order of it could be from 50 hectares to 2,000 hectares per care, depending on how productive the country is. So that suggests to us that the Sydney Basin is a good place to find dinner and the urban environment is a great place to go hunting and it allows this population to actually boost up, which is why I think we're seeing our urban owls actually throw our babies back into the forest rather than the other way around, at least down here in the Sydney Basin. I think if we looked at the owls in Brisbane, it would probably be a different story. So around two, two kilometre radius around the nest tree in urban spaces is quite typical. Okay, a couple of questions have come through about their feeding behaviours. Um, so someone has said, as possum guts have been seen in Queen Elizabeth Park in Concord in Sydney, <laughs> yes. it's expected that there's a powerful owl there. Um, when would be the best time to, to spot the owl? Hard to do. Um, always hard to do because owls will move around. Um, I know about the possum guts in your park. I'm excited about it. <laughs> and there are owls, you know, within the vicinity of that park, definitely. So what we have is a population of owls that sit on territories and stay there and use that territory and do their breeding. And then a population of owls that don't have a defined territory. So these are birds that we call floaters and they just move around. So generally this is the way for all birds to actually find out where they can stop and stay and breed is that there are these existing territories that are like a jigsaw puzzle that fit together in the Sydney Basin and then the young ones or potentially birds that can't find a territory will just move through where the existing territories exist. So these are our floating birds. And I suspect that um, that park bird might be a bit of a floater. He's too far away for general foraging from the known territories that exist. Um, and whether or not we can, and floaters are really important. They're the, the up and coming um, population of breeding owls as time goes on. So it might take young birds. We don't actually know the answer to this, but it could be somewhere from um, the, the published records say 10 years to start breeding um, after they've fledged. But People have said they've seen breeds bird in a year post fledge. So I think the, the real number is somewhere in between that, maybe five or six years that birds might spend this time floating around. And I would say that possum guts is a really indicative sign of, of our work, particularly if you're seeing it in the same spot all the time, because owls are creatures of habit. They love to do the same thing over and again. So when they find a good butchery tree, they'll keep using it. Often people are quite freaked out about this because they don't know what's going on and they think um, an axe murderer is throwing stuff at their house, but no, that's generally just owls doing their work. And I would say that owls are incredibly disdainful of humans and I often I get pictures of people that have just got possum, you know, just thrown down on the windscreen of their car, like, ha, ah, humans, take it. <laughs> so um, there's all of this really distinctive stuff that you see when you know owls are around. The possum guts being one of it, you might be lucky enough to have a roost in your garden um, or the bushland at the back of your house and you'll see big splashes of whitewash, which is how we pick where owls are. Often when I'm walking for owls, I don't bother looking up at all because it's they're very camouflaged, they're quite hard to see. Usually you can tell what's going on by looking at what's left behind on the ground and that will be whitewash, so poo. And the way that's arranged in the environment will tell us where the owls are. And also pellets are another great sign that owls are roosting. And often when you can find an area like that, even if your owl's not there, you know that he's going to come back and use the same place again. So in terms of finding your bird, it might be quite hard if he's moving through. He's a floater that's moving through, but um, really listening for calls on dusk is a great way to actually work. So go for a walk in the evening just as it starts to get dark, wait for the coffees to stop calling and the kookaburras to stop calling and then the owls generally start up. But if you're finding consistent butchery, it means your owl's going to turn up at some stage. Yeah, great. Um, so someone has commented that they've seen them in the Oatley area. Um, and can you explain how they kill the possums? They don't seem to eat the whole body, just the head. <laughs> yes. Well, I would say looking at our pellets, I'm quite... Um, au fait with what it is that owls do like to eat and it will be heads, forearms and tails. <laughs> Those are the bits of bones that we find in the in the pellets that are regurgitated out most commonly. Um, Cut. <laughs> yes, so I think owls, you know, all of the power of the powerful owl is in the feet. It's not, um, I'm going to attack you with my beak. It's more about this owl, you know, pounds of pressure per square inch is about 20 kpi for owl. Our grip strength, we're talking about 200 for a powerful owl foot. 
So I think a lot of the time that, and you see it a lot when they're actually caching prayers that they've turned the rib cage inside out. I'm sorry if this is gross for everybody, but I just love a bit of gross stuff, but <laughs> this is the way that ours forage and I've actually seen them um, and heard people tell stories of watching them catch possums where they just come in. Usually they come from behind, they don't come in front of the prey. They um, put claws into the thorax of the animal and just turn it inside out and they're so strong that they can just turn it inside out. And most of the time, death is fairly instantaneous. I know there was a video going around of a young owl subduing a, um, a ringtail possum down on the road. And this is a big part of what's going on and why road trauma is such a, a problem for these birds is that when they're loaded and carrying a heavy bit of dinner, they fly low and they're using the roads as flight paths because we've got this massive wingspan and you can't manage that in the forest, it's too thickety. So they're using the tracks and the pathways to fly along carrying this heavy dinner and because they fly low, that's often when they encounter cars. Um, so the whole mm -hmm. idea of how they move in the forest and how we can develop great movement pathways really ties into what it is that they're eating. So it's about, it's a holistic approach to good hours as finding a place for them to move through, finding, making safe pathways for them to do that and boosting the prey population to encourage them to actually use these pathways and hopefully with our feathers, that's some of the stuff that we can work out and, and communicate to everybody. All right, we've had um, another question come through about um, their nesting hollows. Um, could you explain more about the role of fungi in a hollow? Are the remnants of food remaining in the nest box? Oh, maybe they mean in the hollow. And then the owls eat the food parts later on? <laughs> no, no, owls are kind of wasteful. I mean, I guess in response to the last question too, when you see an owl caching prey, often it doesn't have a head. Heads are incredibly, brains are incredibly nutritious. Um, and most wildlife will actually eat brains in preference to anything else, provided they can get into it. So when you see, often see an owl hanging onto a possum, the the hindquarters of the possum will be dangling down or you might have the whole body but no head um, and that's quite typical of powerful owl prey so which is I think the head's gone down the hole which is what the pellets tell us is happening and they're holding on to the rest of dinner for later. Uh, sorry can you repeat the question again and I'll answer it directly. Um, there was a, the first part of the question was about the role of fungi in the hollow. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The answer is we don't know because no one's had a look. Um, Tree hollows are this amazing um, unknown environment. Um, it's one of the new frontiers in ecology is to understand hollows. We know that they're incredibly important for vast amounts of species. And um, most, you know, most, probably if we calculated it, something like 40% of all of our Australian wildlife would have to use hollows to actually go through their life cycle, which includes about 17% of our birds and nearly 35% of all of our mammals. It's, they're an incredibly important place, but we just, they're hard to get to. We don't have that many climbers and um, as I said, they're incredibly dynamic. Um, we've been replicating hollows trying to measure what a, the thermal environment of a natural tree hollow looks like to make a nest box act the same way, which we have been able to do, but still ours don't like them. The same thing for cut-in hollows, which are this new wave of hollow development where you chainsaw a hole into the hollow the right size for whatever bird you're trying to encourage or bat or possum. Um, and they've been, fit. well, it's not that they're unsuccessful. I think it's because they're too young. Um, this environment inside the hollow, if you read David Flay's accounts of uh, stealing chicks out of nests that happened in the 20s and 30s, he'll tell you that he pulled out mounds of possum and prey bits and pieces from the hollow. That's not what we see at the end of the season. So he gets his chicks when they're quite early, a couple of weeks after they've um, hatched out of the egg or had gotten his chicks in historically. Um, we don't know anything about the chicks until they actually come up out of the hollow and then we look in the hollow and there's nothing there. So in between that process of four weeks where there's heaps of bits and pieces of food, prey items and prey remains down in the hollow to looking in the hollow with nothing left just after the owls have gotten out, we know that there has to be something going on that causes this massive recycling um, to happen. And the, the, the real answer is we don't know because no one's looked. But Someone told me about a magic product that they use in chicken farms where they um, throw it down on the chicken manure and it just dissolves the manure. And I suspect that this, and it's a microbial product, and I think that's probably going to be one of the answers for making a really effective nest box. Because unlike parrots that carry stuff away from the hollow or do building in the hollow, owls don't build. They just use what actually exists there. They don't chew um, the timbers to make an entrance hole to get into a hollow, they just use what exists. And it's the same for prey remains. They don't carry 
bits and pieces away after they don't want them there or in the hollow with the chicks and mum. Interesting. Um, so someone has commented um, about they had seen on a TV show where they scanned the nest or, or sort of took a mould of an existing nest. Um, has this been attempted for the powerful owl? Yes, it has been attempted for the owl. So there's a project by Dan Parker down in um, in Victoria where they've put up an artificial hollow that they've 3D printed. No birds in it yet. <laughs> But we've got to keep trying, you know, if we don't try, it's never going to happen. Um, and so everyone is trying a whole heap of, I've seen some up on the northern, uh, north and northern New South Wales, some people that are doing wheelie beams up in trees is a great way to make our hollows, they're the right size, but they probably get too hot. And I think replicating what exists inside a natural hollow and understanding why dead hollows and living hollows differ from each other. And that's, you know, it's really important for our Dead hollows um, are one of the things that we don't like in the environment. We think that they're an ugly feature of the environment often in the urban space and they're cut down or we think that they're a dangerous feature and they're cut down, but they are incredibly important when we have a wet year because they allow the chamber to drain. So this, um, in the, the, actually the picture that's on screen, you can see the hollow entrance is pointing straight up to the sky. Use my mouse. Up here, straight up to the sky. So that hollow would be incredibly inundated in a wet year. If that was a living tree hollow, um, it would have flooded and we would have lost the nest. So these dead features are, are so important for microbats and particularly for a large forest owls. And it's a matter of working out why it is that they're good and making sure that we retain choices inside a, a territory for the owls to use in different um, weather conditions to make sure breeding will be most successful. Um, and do they go back to the same tree hollow each year? Um, how far do they move? Yeah, they often do go back to the same tree hollow each year, depending on how many hollows a, a territory can support. Um, but they're creatures of habit, as I said, and they will use the same hollow if they have the opportunity to and the weather permits that they will use it. Um, in some cases, there is only one choice of hollow, so they have to keep using the same thing. And even in a bad year, they'll use it and they'll just fail and they'll have the eggs, but the eggs won't hatch or the babies will die. Um, what more to say on that? Um, repeat the question, I'll see if there's anything else. Um, how far would they move um, from the, the nesting hollow? So right after they, right the after they uh, fledge, the chicks and the parents are all sitting together, like that the family, and they'll stay like that for about a month or so after they fledge out of the hollow. It's rare that an owlet will go out, fledge out of the hollow and then go back in generally because hollows are quite high, often between 6 and 15 megas, and owlets fly so badly that when they fly, the flight at the hollow entrance just goes down, and often that's why they hit the ground. We fledge and say they go like a brick, because they, they do, they actually hit the ground most of the time and then have to climb. They can't fly, they actually flap and climb back up to mum and dad. Um, so they don't really go anywhere after they first fledge for at least a month or so until they learn to manage their wings. And often they're not in the riparian space that's so um, common to find them in for the rest of the year because it's too thick in there for the babies. So often the parents will pull the young ones just to the woodlandy margin on the outside of the riparian strip where there's a bit more space for them to learn to manoeuvre. And then when they get a bit better at using their wings, they'll drop back into the creekways pop up. Um, in a territory... Provisioning young like that is incredibly um, labour intensive for mum and dad and they're catching a huge amount of prey, so much so that they might be bringing three or four possums a night in to feed the chicks. So they're eating more than their own body weight every day in food, which leaves a lot of mess around, which is good for us to find, to find where the owl trees are, um, but also attracts foxes. And I think that's a big part of why we see a lot of fox activity in our territory just before chicks fledge, because there's all this prey remain stuff going on, but there's also a big smell from the hollow and there's the chicks that are making this really distinctive trilling noise. But anyway, aside from that, how far owls move is once they learn to use their wings, they've eaten the prey base around the core part of the territory because they've been using it so heavily. So they often move away from the territory, but often before the chicks fledge, you'll see the chick come back into the core part of the territory by itself. And then before it goes, it'll spend a month or so hanging around where it actually originated from and then it will go. And often it does that without mum and dad. It's a bit more independent at that time. It depends on how big the patch is, um, how far they will actually go. But usually they're within actually kilometres of, of that core part of the territory and whilst they're young, not, not very far at all. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, we might finish up soon. 
Um, I think we're over an hour now. Um, might just answer. Someone had asked, um, is there a way for the public to see um, a powerful owl? So is there a, a guided walk that they could do or what's the best way for members of the public to see them? The answer is no. Um, this is a threatened species and we're really careful about making sure that they're not exposed to high visitation because that's um, one of the things that will actually cause the nesting to fail. So um, most people encounter powerful owls because they know that they're in the environment and hear them, but in terms of um, guided walks to actually see them, the answer is no. And we shouldn't really be doing that for threatened species of any sort, particularly. Um, owls are quite sensitive to disturbance, and I think these this species of owl is probably less twitchy than some of the other species, which don't really like the urban space particularly, but use the margins of the urban space. Um, but yeah, we're really quite careful about being mindful that we need to give them their space to do their thing. And so even in the project when we monitor, once the chicks actually fledge, we stop monitoring and give them, you know, half of the year to just go and be ours rather than continuing to bother them <laughs> with our looking. And not that we try to do all the things that make sure we have no impact. Of course, we're really careful, but it's nice to just let them be ours. Yeah, definitely. We need to do all that we can to protect them. Yeah. Uh, we might just answer one more if that's okay with you, Beth. There's there's quite a few more, but I think we'll have to um, finish up because it's um, gone a bit over time. But just talk um, to me on Facebook if anyone look up for the Powerful Hour Project page and I'll try to um, answer your questions there. If there's things that I haven't answered or email me, I'm very happy to, to help you learn more. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so maybe just a finishing question. What's the overall um, population trend, do you think, for the powerful owl? Is there, are you seeing signs of recovery or are they still in decline? They're still in decline along with the rest of their friends. And I think that's why we work so hard to make sure we do the best that we can in the urban space where we know we have a good population because even in the urban space, the amount of mortality is massive, particularly through road strike, but also glass strike is becoming important and electrocution is another thing that they face here. Um, so I think that if we don't continue to do our good work, we, we're in a position where there's enough of this species that if we do the right thing now, we can keep them. But if we don't do the right thing and we, you know, burn them all while they're in their nests, which is what's happening at the moment, then we, um, we're not going to see this species stay with us for too long. So really, you know, making sure that we keep talking to each other, the public, to the land managers, to BirdLife, to National Parks, to whoever you want to report to. Just make sure that you let someone know that your birds are there and that you're hearing them. That's the best way that we can, that's the first step in actually making sure we do our very best to keep them with us. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, we might finish up there. Thank you so much, Beth. It was a, a brilliant talk and yeah, always fascinating to hear from you. And I really appreciate your time answering all these questions. Um, as Beth mentioned, you can jump on Facebook. Um, we've just popped the link in the um, chat box for people to um, jump in there and ask any other questions that we didn't get a chance to answer today. Um, we have also recorded this um, presentation, so that will be posted up um, yeah, in, in maybe in a couple of days. Um, so you can watch back and um, share it with anyone that might, might have missed it. So thank you so much and have a brilliant day, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you and see you later. Enjoy your threatened species. Have fun. <laughs> Thanks.